today as we come to the table. Now, we expect the unbeliever to deny the miracles of God, but how sad it is when the religious uh, deny it as well. And these are the religious leaders. And remember, this really just brings to the forefront the difference between religious, being religious, and having a relationship. You can be as religious as you want to be and not even know God. A relationship is just that. It's a relationship. And when we have a relationship, now we know our God on a personal way and not just a religious or book knowledge way. And so we're going to see that these guys have that book knowledge religious way, but they don't know the Lord. Irrefutable evidence. And sometimes people respond, sometimes they don't. There's a massive difference between knowing about God and knowing Him. As Pastor Mark will point out in today's message, many religious people in Jesus' day knew God's Word better than the back of their hand. They had picked it apart and analyzed it in a way that would put us to shame, yet they totally missed the Messiah it foretold. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. It's vital that you keep your heart open to the work of God. It doesn't always look how you'd expect. This means you'll need to spend time in prayer and study His Word, not simply to equip yourself for theological debates or to quote unquote, follow the rules, but for the purpose of growing in intimacy with your Heavenly Father. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John, chapter 9, as he shows us the irrefutable truth. John, chapter 9, verses 13 through 41. Irrefutable proof. Now, last week we started looking at Jesus healing a blind man born from birth. Remember, and it may take us even a couple of weeks to finish this. But today we're going to continue looking at this story with the confrontation of the religious leaders about the healing that the Lord had done. And we're going to see that no matter how irrefutable the evidence or the proof of this miracle is, they still choose to deny it. And guys, I want you to note this. I don't care what kind of evidence you have for your life and what God has done in your life or someone else's life, there are going to be some who simply choose not to believe it. Whether you're set free from drugs or set free from alcohol or God does some miracle in your life that's irrefutable, a physical healing takes place. Everyone knows that you had leukemia and you no longer do, which happened to one of the Calvary pastors. God supernaturally just heals you and the world doesn't know what to do with it. They, they look at each other and say, well, that can't be true. Some that believe or that, that are open to believe will believe in God. Others will mock. Others will say you're making it up. You're lying. They won't believe no matter what you do. And I think one of the most shocking things uh, that I've learned as a believer is no matter how irrefutable the evidence of the Lord is, some people still choose. And notice I said choose because you have to choose to ignore the evidence. They choose not to believe. They choose to reject. And that's exactly what these guys are going to do today. Now, we expect the unbeliever to deny the miracles of God, but how sad it is when the religious uh, deny it as well. And these are the religious leaders. And remember, this really just brings to the forefront the difference between religious, being religious, and having a relationship. You can be as religious as you want to be and not even know God. A relationship is just that. It's a relationship. And when we have a relationship, now we know our God on a personal way and not just a religious or book knowledge way. And so we're going to see that these guys have that book knowledge religious way, but they don't know the Lord. Irrefutable evidence. And sometimes, uh, sometimes, as I said, people respond, sometimes they don't. I ran across this story uh, about the artist Paul Gustave Dorr. And I'm not a big art fan, but I know the name, and maybe some of you guys have heard of him. He was from the 1800s, very famous artist. Uh, He lost his uh, passport while traveling in Europe, true story. And when he came to the border, he had a predicament. He didn't have his passport to get back in. They wouldn't believe him. And he said, I tell you, I'm who I say I am. And I lost my passport. How do I get back into my country? And the border agent had a very good idea. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, take this powder here and draw these people standing around us. (laughs) 
I thought, well, that's pretty good. That's going to prove it. According to the story, he grabbed the pad and skillfully and beautifully started sketching everyone in just amazing detail, and they led him in the country. Why? Because they saw the irrefutable evidence that he was who he said he was. Now, that's how it is for a lot of people today with Jesus. They see the irrefutable evidence once they see it, and it makes them believe. There might even be some this morning and some that hear this message later uh, that hear the irrefutable evidence of what we talked about that's going on in the world and what Jesus said would be happening, and maybe they'll believe. But there's another category as well, and it's a category of those who are mockers, and they will not only not believe, they'll, they refuse to believe. That is the Pharisees. This, this is who we're dealing with today in this passage with the blind man. As you remember, Jesus put the mud in his eyes, sent him down to the pool of Siloam. He washed. He came back seeing. Everybody's talking about there's a stir. What happened to you? You're not the guy. Yes, I am the guy. All these things are going. And that's where we take up in verse 13. Because now they're going to bring him before the Pharisees, the religious leaders, again, because remember, uh, they, they're the ones that are supposed to evaluate everything that happens spiritually, although they themselves are blind, which is very ironic in this story. But it says, that, verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now, I love the way it points out he was formerly blind, because many of us in this room were formerly blind, and now we can see. It's no longer how we are. We used to be that way, but we're not that way anymore. I don't know if there's anybody been healed physically of blindness. I know that's very rare today. I don't know of any instances that have happened since Jesus. Maybe it has. But those of us that know the Lord in here have all been healed spiritually. And so we now see and we, we recognize that. And notice they're brought to the Pharisees. And it's interesting, whenever God touches a life, it always seems that the religious around us begin to gather and to fight against us. I remember when I first came to the Lord and I didn't know anything but Jesus and a little bit of the Bible and I was all excited. I had all these religious people coming out of the woodwork when they would hear me share my faith and tell me what I believed, why what I believed wasn't true. And this same thing is happening here. People want to come out of the woodwork and refute it. And sadly, it's often those who wear the robes and look should be the ones that are following God and oftentimes look the most religious. But these were actually the religious leaders. They were the Pharisees that are going to reject him here. Who were the Pharisees? A little bit of information on them. They were the religious leaders in Israel as well as the Sadducees. And they actually started out good. The Pharisees didn't start bad. They were following God. They started doing the right thing. But as they got more and more religious and got more and more man-made rules for their group, you know, we might make a modern-day application today and say they became more and more, had their own denominational rules if you were going to be a part of their group. They got further and further away from God's Word. And so then they got into all these man-made rules and all these man-made regulations, and they laid these burdens on the people, and, and it got completely ridiculous, even to the point where everything was so legalistic that no one could possibly serve God the way they were saying. And so now we see these unbelieving Pharisees, these unbelievers, if you want to modernize it, confronted with undeniable evidence that God has moved and that God is real, and what they do with it is going to determine their eternal destiny. And the same thing is true for all of us in this room. When God shows us that he is real and that his, there's irrefutable evidence for what he said and who he is, what we do with that determines our eternal destiny. If we reject it, we're eternally separated from God. If we receive it, we're eternally welcomed into the kingdom of God. And so, again, there's clear, undeniable proof here in this whole situation. And watch how they respond to it. Look at verse 14. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made clay and opened his eyes. Again, that should be an immediate warning to us. Why is that so important to the Holy Spirit to point out? Because remember, because of all their man-made rules that we talked about last week, you couldn't do any work on the Sabbath. And spitting, remember, in the soil was plowing because it made a furrow. And making mud was doing work on the Sabbath. You, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't wear any, any sandals that had nails in them holding the leather together because you were carrying a burden. I mean, the, the regulations were, were just ridiculous. And they went on and on and on. And so you don't want to gloss over it when it says here that, it was a Sabbath uh, because, again, this is what really got them so upset because they were breaking their man-made rules. And if you want to see uh, some religious people get upset, start breaking their man-made rules. It bothers them. You know, you, our job is to stick to the Word of God. Obey God. This is your standard. This is what you go by, not by rules and regulations that other people put on your life. God had no such restriction for the Sabbath as these men did. As a matter of fact, Jesus was and is God, and he was the one doing it. So if God's okay with doing it, then we're fine. <laughs> we can rest. And so again, um, interesting, their standard of no burdens on the Sabbath caused them to put a, bu a bunch of burdens on the people that they couldn't even bear. And that's what religion does. It puts burdens on the backs of the people they can't bear. But relationship sets us free. 
And that's why we always, as believers, are to push relationship. And so again, notice what happens. Therefore, some of the Pharisees, again, this was done on the Sabbath. I'm sorry, verse 15. And the Pharisees also asked him again. Remember, they already asked him one time before how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes. I washed and I see. I love the simplicity of this. It's not hard. There's not a big theological issue that has to be solved. We don't have to work over, you know, doctrine and work our way through all this stuff. It's just Jesus and I believe him and look what he did. And guys, that's the beauty of being a Christian. It's very simple. It's not complicated. So many people try to make it complicated. And again, we're going to see the Pharisees uh, try to make it more and more complicated as we go through this passage. And finally, the man just says, look, I don't know what you guys are saying, but I know what Jesus did. But again, it's interesting. They'd already been told, but they simply couldn't see it. And that is oftentimes the case with the unbeliever. No matter how simple something is or how many times you tell them, they just can't get it because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. There's no other way to understand things of the Bible except by the Spirit. You can read it and go, okay, it's, maybe it's good literature, and maybe there's, I, I see this and that, but then everybody decides what it means. You've noticed that people that don't know the Lord, they read the Bible, and they all come up with their interpretation. When God opens your eyes, all that your interpretation stuff goes out the window because God shows you what it means. Now, I know that we don't know everything. I know there's some things we don't understand. I know there are disagreements within the body of Christ on some non-essentials. I get that. It's where we have to just trust the Lord and have faith and let God lead us. But the Bible, for those who know him, it's not hard to understand. It's very simple. As a matter of fact, the Lord said, Father, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent. Interpretation, those who think they know it all. He says, but you've revealed them to the babes. That is those who just say, Jesus, whatever you say, I just believe it. I just believe it. You know, you tell a little kid anything and they just believe it. And you see these little kids, you know, on the YouTube video where somebody gets their nose, right? Go my nose. I'm keeping it. I'm, oh, I'm on my nose. Oh. They believe. I know it's mean. I, I'm, it's, you know, I wouldn't do that. But they believe it. Why? Because they have a childlike belief. They just believe what someone in authority, an adult, will tell them. The Lord says, as believers, I want you to be that way. He says, you're my kids. I would never lie to you. I would never pretend to have your nose and not really have it. He says, what I say is true, and I don't play games with you. I don't, I don't toy with you. So I want you to trust me. But others don't understand how we can have free choice and how there can be predestination. Who cares? Who cares? No, I can't. My, my brain's too small for that. But I trust you. I trust you. I, your Bible says both exist. So you know what I believe? I believe both. But you can't believe both. Well, I do. Because the Bible teaches both. So I just, as a child, I'll figure it out. God, when I get in heaven, you show me what I need to know. I'll know that then, but I believe you because you're true to your word. This is what God expects. And this is what I love about this manner. There's this innocence to him, this purity to him. He's just believing what his daddy told him. And he doesn't even know yet that it's his daddy. He doesn't know yet that it's Jesus. He doesn't know yet that Jesus is God. All he knows is, is this is what happened. And I believe him. And so he just gives this straightforward answer. And again, last week we noted that, again, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to be able to share your faith. You simply have to know the facts. You know what? Jesus touched me and I'm a different person. And if you let him touch you, you'll be a different person as well. What about all these things? All I know is he died on the cross and resurrected. If you believe that, you'll be saved. Guys, that's all you need to know. Now, the religious people who want to get into all the theological arguments and tie things up in knots, they'll fight with you forever about what this and you've got to prove and you stand whatever. Look, let them do it. Just smile and have peace and enjoy the Lord. And say, if you want to have peace and just enjoy the Lord as well, you don't have to understand every detail. Just love him and he'll love you. He'll teach you as you grow, as you get in the word. I'm not saying we're not supposed to be those who know the word of God and, and are able to share our faith. But again, there seems to be so much emphasis oftentimes on, on, on everything being so theologically correct that we can't just enjoy the Lord and just believe his word for what it says. And so I love this about this guy. It's a beauty and simplicity. And you see that in new believers. When a new believer comes to the Lord, they just, they just believe what their daddy says. And it's exciting. And we need to get back to that if we've gotten too, too theological and too high-minded in our brains, so to speak. And therefore, they said in verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. Now, they start reasoning all their reasons why. They can't see what's right in front of their face. They have to go back to their theology. This man is not from God because... He does not keep the Sabbath. Stop right there. Yes, he was keeping the Sabbath. The problem was he wasn't keeping the Sabbath according to your rules. Had nothing to do with the Bible. 
It was what you came up with in your group, your denomination, your religion, whatever it is. You came up with it. God didn't say that. Now, I don't suggest walking around here on Sunday spitting. But if you do, you're not in sin, all right? Now, you'll get fussed at. I'll probably hand you a mop and make you clean it up. Because it's just rude. But it's not sin. And so they immediately say Jesus, because of their preconceived notions of what they decided was right and wrong, they say that he's broken the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who's a sinner do such things? In other words, one group is saying there's no way he's legitimate because we see what he, you know, he's breaking our rules. The other guys are going, but wait a minute. He might have broken our rules, but who can make blind people see? I mean, we've got to realize something's going on here. So there's a fight between them, some of them at least acknowledging that something amazing has happened. And there was the division among them. And again, uh, the division, it's interesting here, there'll always be a division. Uh, rather than simply looking at God and his word in the scripture, they try to, to reason it out too much and deny the miracle, if you will, and it causes a, a division, and oftentimes the division is simply because we, we just don't believe God's word, simply and straight up. And again, you'll see division among believers, you'll see division among believers and unbelievers, and that's, there's going to be things we don't agree on, that's fine among believers, but we need to realize it's the essentials that we stand on, not the non-essentials. But when it comes to the world, there's going to be division from us when it comes to the Lord. Jesus said, I've come to bring a sword to divide people. Again, the sword is the word of God. It's not that he wants us divided from the world, but he wants us to say, are you going to stand with me or not? And those that choose to stand with me, they're going to be separate from the world. And the world's not going to like them. But you are to love the world, even though they don't like you. And so this whole process here of you know, them trying to evaluate this and decide what they're going to do with this guy, how they're going to do this, rather than simply believing the evidence that's in front of them. And notice they didn't care about the evidence. This is interesting to me. They are refusing by choice because of pride, and they're denying the evidence in front of them. They were focused on refuting it no matter what, just denying it no matter what. You can't even allow it. This is amazing to me how people do this. You know, it's interesting. They found another dinosaur. Maybe you heard this week or the last week. It was in the news. They find these amazing finds of dinosaurs that defy modern science logic. A few years back, they found this Tyrannosaurus rex, and uh, they had to break its leg to get it into the helicopter. There was some, no other way to get it out of the place it was in. They didn't want to break the leg. It's this, what they believe, multi-millions of years old creature. And they break the leg and put it in the helicopter. Well, they get back to the museum, and guess what they find out? They're still red blood cells and, and, and tissue in that bone. And they're, they're shocked by it going, whoa, that's impossible. Red blood cells and tissues? I mean, they, at the most, they could live a few thousand years in the proper environment, but not for millions. And you would think at that point, click, wait a minute. Could we be wrong? But instead, here's what the scientists came up with. Rather than saying, maybe we should look at the Bible again and think this through a little bit. Rather than that, they said, we have made an amazing discovery. Red blood cells and tissue can survive in a bone for millions and millions of years. My jaw dropped. I said, the extent you will go to to prove what your preconceived belief is, is astounding, no matter the evidence. They found another dinosaur. I won't even try to say his name. I don't remember it. But he was fully preserved. One of these that has like the shell on his back and whatever. And you know, when the, remember when, remember when T-Rex was fighting him in the movies and they had the short one, the big one? The, little, the boys remember that anyway. This was the short one that was looking up at the T-Rex. They found one of those guys or something like that. He's so well preserved. He's defying everything because again, what they're saying is and where he is, he should have number one been eaten by something when he decayed or he should have decayed or he should have been crushed by millions of years of dirt and stuff going on and all stuff. And he's perfectly preserved and normal. And again, what did they do? They didn't say, you know, maybe we need to rethink this. What they made an announcement this week, I was reading it. They said, we have made a new discovery. That a, that a creature can literally be buried by, by tons and tons of material, can be floating in water where, where predators are, can face the elements of decay and somehow not decay, not get eaten and not get crushed and be perfectly preserved in a full specimen. It's truly amazing what can happen. And I thought, yes, it is truly amazing when you don't believe God's word. When you believe God's word, you know that there was a flood a few thousand years ago. It covered the entire earth. It took the animals and swept them up and covered them quickly in mud, which would naturally preserve them. That's why we find fossils and bones. And now we find them. And what should we find if that really happened? We should find fossils of different animals all around the world buried under different sediments and layers. Guess what we find? Fossils all around the world buried under different sediment layers. 
And yet rather than acknowledging the Bible, science has proven right. This is no different than what these guys are doing. Everybody said, I don't care that this guy was blind and can see now. We know that Jesus cannot be the only one to heaven. He can't be the Messiah. This can't be right. So we refuse to believe it. And again, the extent they'll go to to refuse to believe it because they don't want to believe what God is doing. They have to prove that it didn't even really happen. And this is their goal and they're doing as while they're doing this. They're trying to prove that it didn't even happen, even though their eyes and the evidence tells them that it did. Notice they claim Jesus wasn't keeping the Sabbath. Again, as we said, that wasn't true. We already noticed that. But further, they justify themselves that Jesus was a sinner. They say, we know this man is a sinner, right? How can a sinner do such signs? And when it speaks of sinner here in the language, it speaks of an emphasis on the fact that he's a sinner, right? Not just a sinner, he's a sinner. That's what it says in the language. The Greek, it just gives this big emphasis on that word. They made a, they made a, but again, from zero evidence, because Jesus said, which of you convicts me of sin? And nobody could. I remember that time. Nobody did. There was no time to remember. He was sinless. He was flawless. And so, again, a lot of false accusations thrown his way. And by the way, when you make a stand for the Lord, you're going to get false accusations thrown your way as well. It's an effort to discredit you and tear you down. And again, as we said, when Jesus comes on the scene, there's going to be division. And now there's some division. And they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And he said, now again, he's, already, he's a prophet. He, they already asked him. Now it's the third time they're going to ask him again. This time he says he's a prophet. Notice the miracle now gives an opportunity here for a witness. And guys, don't miss this. God's going to do things in your life that are going to give you an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord. And that's exactly what happens here. God touches his life. God gives you an opportunity. So you need to be ready. You say, well, I don't know that I'll be ready when that chance comes. Remember, this guy, all he knew, we're talking baby, baby Christian. All he knew is that Jesus touched him and he was blind and now he can see. That's all you need to know. That right there, if truly you've been touched and everybody can see it, that's the only power that you need. That's it. And so they say, what do you say about him? Which is all that really matters is what we say about the Lord. And notice not fully knowing who Jesus was at this point yet. What does he say? He says he is a prophet, which is true. He was a prophet, but it certainly didn't stop there. Much more than a prophet. It's God in human form. And so he didn't understand that yet, but he's telling him, hey, he's a prophet. Well, that wouldn't fly with these guys because they don't want to even acknowledge he's a prophet because they hate him. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. Again, they're refusing the evidence in front of them until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. Again, many won't believe you either when you tell them of what Jesus has done in your life. And even if somebody else tells them, they still won't believe because we're going to see that's exactly what, what happens here. They're going to ride it off the chance and sometimes even lying. You know, you're lying. That didn't really happen in your life. And now the parents are going to have to verify this. And so they asked them, look at this, verse 19. And they asked them saying, is this your son whom you say? Look at the doubt there. They're, they don't even believe them before they get a chance to tell them it's their son. Is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Interesting, they're having the dilemma of believing it, but then they're having to confirm he sees. He's the one you say was blind, well then how can he see? It's like, These guys are torn apart right now. This is not good, but that's again what happens to the person that rejects the obvious evidence in front of them. And so they basically don't believe the parents before they even answer because they've already chosen not to believe. Thanks for spending the last half hour with us at the table of God's Word. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of John next time, but you don't have to wait for our next episode to keep digging into the Bible. You can access more messages right now at pastormarkkirk.com or subscribe to the daily podcast right from our website. And feel free to share these teachings with your friends or family members or someone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. The book of John is a great introduction to who Jesus is, and it might just be the conversation starter you've been looking for. That website again is pastormarkkirk.com. Hey, are you listening right now in the Knoxville area? If so, we want to meet you. 
Here's Pastor Mark with a personal invitation. Thanks, Greg. I want to let you know there's a seat waiting for you here at Calvary Knoxville. We've been here since 1997, and it's been an honor to see God do such incredible things in our fellowship and in this community. Come join us as we invest in God's Word and in each other. And yes, we're meeting in person. All our services and ministries are being held each week, but we're also streaming online for those who can't make it in person. You can find out everything by clicking on the Our Church section at PastorMarkKirk.com. I'm excited to see you this weekend, and I hope you'll join me again the next time we come to the table. to the table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville